In this video, I answer the questions, what is an annotation? Is gene annotation an authentic research experience? What resources are available to annotate genes? And what are some of the strategies for gene annotation? In creating this video, I drew from several resources, including the NCBI, published work, and colleagues associated with the Microbial Genome Annotation Network. While benchtop research takes place in the research lab, a gene annotation project takes place in the computer lab. Kunin and Gelperin define gene annotation as follows. It is a subfield in the general field of genome analysis, which includes anything that can be done with genome sequences by computational means. Second, it's the part of genome analysis that is customarily performed before a genome sequence is deposited in GenBank and described in a published paper. I emphasize here the word customarily because current DNA sequencing capacity has vastly outpaced annotation capacity. Automated annotations are often uploaded without manual curation. I'll talk about the importance of manual annotation in a few slides. But it's through manual annotation that students can be involved in an authentic research experience in gene annotation. And then another, predict another definition of an annotation, it is a prediction of the function of a gene or region of a chromosome using computational means. Gene annotation uses bioinformatics tools to analyze sequence information, make predictions about structural elements, and the function of DNA regions based on similarities to known sequences. A genome annotation can be used to predict the function of an open reading frame. It can be used to predict where a gene starts and ends. It can be used to predict regulatory elements controlling gene expression. It can be used to predict cellular location of the translated protein, if a protein is modified or not post-translationally. And it can also predict phylogenetic relationships. You can also use genome annotation to look at non-coding regions, tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs. It's important to understand that gene annotation is a prediction of function, and experimental evidence called functional genomics is needed to confirm those predictions. So basically, a gene annotation precedes the functional genomics work. After a genome is sequenced, the data are run through a variety of automated programs that predict the function of open reading frames. This flowchart outlines the process of annotating a genome sequence. First, statistical gene predictions are made. Bioinformatics tools such as GeneMark or Glimmer are used to predict protein coding genes in this sequence. Moving backward, feedback from gene identification can then be used to correct sequencing errors, so primarily frame shifts in the DNA sequence. Moving forward again, General sequence databases are searched for homology or similar sequences, um, usually using BLAST or a BLAST-based program. Next, predictions of structural features are made um, from the putative protein calls. And these use other programs which can um, look for signal peptide sequences, transmembrane segments, coiled domain, and other features in putative proteins. Specialized databases are then searched, and a few of these include PFAM, CDD, COGS, TigerFAM. Uh, some metabolic databases such as KEG, Metapsych can all add information to an annotation. Now, don't worry, you'll become more familiar with the alphabet soup of acronyms used in gene annotation over time. Finally, genome context analysis and functional predictions are made. There is no doubt that homology analysis remains the central methodology of genomics, looking for similar sequences that have already been identified in a larger database. However, an approach in comparative genomics goes beyond sequence or structure comparisons. These methods are known as genome context analysis, and the notion of context here includes all the types of associations between genes and proteins in the same or different genomes that may point to functional interactions. Or in other words, if gene A is involved in function X and we obtain evidence that gene B functionally associates with gene A, then B is probably also involved in function X. More specifically, context in comparative genomics pertains to evolutionary profiles of protein families, uh, domain fusions and multi-domain proteins, looking for gene adjacency in genomes and operon composition, 
and expression patterns. Indeed, genes whose products are involved in closely related functions for example, they form different subunits of a multi-subunit enzyme or participate in the same pathway, should all be either present or absent in a certain set of genomes. They should have similar, if not identical, evolutionary patterns and should be coordinately expressed. And of course, should doesn't always mean always, um, but you might start off with this as a good hypothesis. This simple logic gives us a potentially powerful way to assign genes that have no experimentally characterized homologs to particular pathways or cellular systems. The question becomes, why manually annotate genes already called by automated approaches? Why not leave it all to the computers? As described earlier, genome annotation has to involve anna automation. No one is going to manually paste each of several thousand protein sequences encoded in a genome into a BLAST query box, hit the BLAST button, and wait for the results to appear on the screen. For annotation to be practical at all, I mean, if it's going to produce any amount of usable information in a relatively short period of time, software is necessary to run such routine tasks in a batch mode and also to organize the results from different programs in a convenient way. Now, each genome project employs one or another set of tools to achieve this. After that point, however, there is a need for manual or what you could probably consider better or expert annotation. First, mistakes are common in automated annotation. Studies on this issue have predicted 8 to 25 percent and possibly as high as 35 percent of gene calls have one or more errors. For example, it's not uncommon to find that the wrong start codon was called. Now, a second reason for having manual annotation is that automated annotations miss things. For example, real genes that don't get called. These omissions are not surprising, especially as we get genome sequences from microbes where uh, very few, if any, members of a certain phyla have been studied in the wet lab. Three, working with students on gene annotations shows them how quickly they can use their biology knowledge to make a difference and how that knowledge of basic biology principles underlies many of the bioinformatics tools that they will use in a deeper annotation. What types of bioinformatics tools are used to annotate a gene? As it turns out, often the same tools that were used in the automated annotation. So you'll see things like IMG-EDU, BLAST, CDD, TigerFAM, PFAM, PDB, TeaCoffee, WebLogo, etc., etc. For most novice bioinformaticists, it's a daunting task to know which programs of the many are appropriate for a specific project. And the list I've got here are just a small fraction of the many bioinformatics programs that are freely accessible online. An NSF-sponsored group of faculty called the Microbial Genome Annotation Network created an online platform called GenieAct to help instructors make these difficult choices. Select publicly available bioinformatics programs are accessed from a single site and data from these programs can be uploaded and organized into a single site called GenieAct. For more information about GenieAct, go to the GenieAct.org website. From this site can be accessed faculty resources to assist you as an instructor in designing your own annotation project. There are also other resources for both faculty and students. One might ask, if an automated annotation is already done, can a manual genome annotation be an authentic research experience? And the answer is it depends on your approach to the annotation project. According to Spell et al. in their 2014 publication, there are a lot of interpretations on what it takes to be an authentic research experience. In this figure from Spelling et al., there are two basic philosophies about what authentic research is. On the left, we see that some instructors define an authentic research experience as moving through the steps of the scientific process. A manual annotation project, if properly designed, can flow through the scientific process. Students can be asked to choose the question of their investigation. Students can form a hypothesis about metabolic processes or the components of a structural feature of a cell. Students can search the literature for published work on the process or structure in other organisms. Students can choose which bioinformatics programs are to be used. Students can collect and interpret the data from these different bioinformatics tools. And then students can present their work in papers, posters, or presentations. 
On the other, on the right-hand side, if asking novel questions is the focus of the project, then a poor, then using a poorly studied microbe can be chosen from the GenBank database. There are a lot of novel questions to be asked regarding how this poorly studied microbe metabolizes, builds cellular structures, or moves nutrients into and out of the cell. A barrier commonly cited as limiting the ability to offer an authentic research experience, that being expense, is gone in a manual annotation project. As a gene annotation project described here, simply needs a computer and access to the internet. There are many approaches one can take in a gene annotation. This figure demonstrates one of those approaches, which is looking for open reading frames along a stretch of the chromosome. This is an image from the Joint Genome Institute's database uh, called IMG, and it predicts the position and functions of genes along a stretch of the chromosome. Each one of these little bands represents a particular open reading frame and the direction of the arrow points in the direction of transcription. It is common to find new open reading frames that were missed in the original annotated gene call. Searching for ORFs using the NCBI's ORF finder followed by the further annotation of those novel genes using programs described earlier results in the discovery of new genes not previously annotated. Another approach is to take a metabolic pathway approach, trying to recreate the particular steps in a metabolic pathway or in a degradative pathway. This is a metabolic pathway image taken from the program called KEG. This is the arginine biosynthesis pathway beginning with glutamate on the left and proceeding through the urea cycle and into arginine on the far right. The red letters are the known enzymes or genes in E. coli. And there's a lot of published functional work to support uh, the arginine biosynthesis pathway in E. coli. The green boxes are genes, enzymes, predicted to be in the organism Mayothermus ruber. Now in this particular example, M. ruber was predicted to be an arginine oxytroph by automated bioinformatics tools. But a student gene annotation project identified a suitable ARGD gene in the M. ruber genome. So manual gene annotation projects taking this approach can use bioinformatics tools to predict how a microbe synthesizes and degrades nutrients. This is another image taken from KEG and it illustrates the components of the respiratory electron transport chain. NADH dehydrogenase is on the left, the ATP synthase complex is on the right. In this approach to gene annotation, components of structural features of a cell are identified and compared across genomes. Again, uh, the instructor uh, would probably choose a microbe that is poorly studied in the attempt to try to, to define how this particular organism composes these structural features. Other strategies um, include those listed here, deeper annotation, naming hypotheticals, searching for examples of horizontal gene transfer, and then searching for processes or chromosome features described in the literature for other organisms. So really a myriad of approaches and questions can be asked in a gene annotation. There is great value in taking on this task, especially if you move away from well-known model systems. Even today, a significant percentage of genes in most genomes are still called hypothetical or conserved hypothetical during automated annotation. Our students can start to move some of these genes out of the hypothetical category into calls that impart much more meaning. Once students are confident using the bioinformatics tools, other tangential questions can be asked. Now maybe you don't have your own microbe to analyze. How can you find unanswered questions for a genome project? Currently there are more than 15,000 complete or draft genome sequences of bacteria and archaea available. These genome sequences, however, show a highly biased phylogenetic distribution when compared to the extent of microbial diversity that we know of today. This bias has resulted in major gaps in our knowledge of microbial genome complexity and our understanding of the evolution, physiology, and metabolic capacity of microbes in general. Under the umbrella of the Genome and the Genomic Encyclopedia of Bacteria and Archaea, or GEBA, the DOE JGI has sequenced hundreds of bacterial and archaeal genomes from diverse branches of the tree of life. 
Now the original Jeeva project was completed in collaboration with the DSMZ and in that pilot study the um, approximately 53 bacterial and three archaeal novel and highly diverse genomes were sequenced representing the first step towards a phylogenetically balanced uh, tree of life. Approximately 200 more Jeeva genomes have since been sequenced. In this graph I compare the number of citations from a PubMed search between well-studied organisms on the left, E. coli, Salmonella typhimerium, Clostridium perfringens, Serratia marcescens, to a few of the Jeeva organisms, um, beginning with M. ruber, and um, then I also searched for Phyla dinococcus and Thermus. So in this graph, what we see are that uh, the organisms on the left, which are very well studied model systems have a lot of citations. E. coli uh, um, had over 35,000 citations. There is little published work on the Jeeva organisms which makes them prime microbes for functional studies to complement the manual annotation. You can identify a Jeeva organism through the JGI's IMG-EDU database. And very quickly, I describe that process here. You go Google search for IMG-EDU. There is a tab um, called Find Genomes, and you can, from a drop-down menu, pull down Genome Browser or Genome Search. Uh, the new page, you can filter by study organism, uh, typing in Jiba, and this will then, uh, you will attain a list of the Jiba organisms. Go down that list looking for any interesting organisms. You can then perform a PubMed search to see how much this organism has been studied. And then I would just recommend choose a poorly studied organism for your genome annotation project. Now the re there are many resources online available to you f to start an annotation project, but I propose these resources, the genieact.org website. This is the GenieAct bioinformatics platform that brings together uh, some of the more common bioinformatics programs into a central location. There are faculty and student resources on the Genie Act blog. There's also protocols on the Genie Science website, protocols for both functional and manual annotation work. And if you are an instructor, there, um, the Microbial Genome Annotation Network, or MGAN, does offer workshops in the use of the Genie Act platform. I hope you found this video helpful. If you are an instructor, I hope this video gave you the confidence to start a genome annotation project of your own, either as a personal research endeavor or as a means of integrating research into your classes. If you are a student, I hope this video gave you some background into the whys and hows of genome annotation.